chin Just keep your head down and carry on You fight like hell, turn the other cheek It's what separates the strong from the weak And that's just the way that the life gets drawn All right, everybody, welcome to episode 10 of 10 Minute Misconduct, the unofficial FPHL podcast. We are officially in double digits, and for our 10th episode, we have probably one of our biggest guests ever, former NHL or current Motor City rocker, Ian White. We are looking forward to this. We were supposed to do this two weeks ago. Had some technical issues, had some brain farts. It happens. We're here. My fault. Sorry, guys. <laughs> he's gonna. He's here. He's gonna be here this week. Hundred percent guaranteed. We're looking forward. This is gonna be great. In a green studio right now. Wait for us. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. So to start off this week, we have some great news. Our guest from last week, Jay Croup, and his girlfriend, fiance have officially announced they are are expecting their first child. So congratulations, Kroopy. Congrats, Kroopy. Yeah, we're really excited uh, for baby Kroop. Yeah, congrats. Congratulations. Not just on the ice. Announced at the same time. Welcome to parenthood. Kroopy doesn't just just score on the ice, apparently. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man! So that's like great news for Kroopy, and again we got Ian White this week. Next week we have another great guest. We've been looking forward to this, and Ryan Marker coming in next week. That's going to be another great one. Wow! So we're keeping the we're keeping the the train rolling. Some of the some of these great, wonderfully amazing guests. Yeah. You know, we're, we're we're killing it, guys. I, I'm pat by ourselves on the back. We're killing it. We're doing pretty darn yeah, good. Yeah, we um, I agree, and um, we just ask for everyone to be patient. We're doing our best to try to get somebody from every team, and it just takes like a little bit of time. But um, drop in the comments below if you have a specific uh, player or team that you want to suggest. We're we're open minded to pretty much anybody, so let us know, and we can uh, try to make it happen. Our goal is to eventually have somebody from every team at least once. Everybody. So let's get let's get Whitey in here and let's get this uh, ball rolling. All right, guys, let's welcome Ian White to the show. We are super excited to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, great to be here. Very excited. Awesome. Welcome. So um, I know we all have a, a ton of questions for you. So, Lee, do you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. Uh, your your history is kind of kind of unique for somebody in the FPHL. You had a a long, you know, nice NHL career. Uh, can you kind of tell us one of the seasons I've noticed that really stuck out was the 2010-11 season? That you know, you were traded twice, but you made it to the conference NHL conference finals. Can you kind of tell us about that season and what it, you know the getting traded twice? What that did with your family situation? Yeah, uh, so prior to going, I started that season in Calgary. Uh, prior to, to getting there, I came from, from Toronto, which I was traded. And start, um, it was my first, or I had arbitration rights that summer, so I, I got traded to Calgary at the, at the deadline, finished the season there, and went, our, uh, chose to go to arbitration. And got a one-year deal, so signed signed uh, for one year with Calgary. Started the season off that year. We didn't have a great start, and I think it was, I mean, it was probably only a month I was there, and we came off a West Coast trip in San Jose in L.A., and uh, the, the ownership told, told management they got to start uh, dumping some players, and I was the only person, only defenseman without a no-trade clause, and so I was the one uh, who got shipped out. So I went to Carolina. Um, so one month into the season, I just moved to Calgary. And I had a young family, two kids, two young kids at the time. Actually, one kid and my my wife at the time was pregnant with another. So I moved all the way from Calgary to Carolina. And I was debating on, you know, getting a house and moving everything down there, getting settled. And, and while I was 
try to make that decision. I was thinking, well, nobody gets traded twice in the season. So sure, get set up down here and got a nice house there, got settled and, and moved the family down. And it was, I would think, about three months. I was only there about three months. And then I guess San Jose called them and they wanted to pick up a, a D-man for their playoff run. So packed up and moved all the way to San Jose. Um, yeah. It was actually, that, that was a, a very exciting time for my career, actually, because San Jose, it, it, in those years anyway, they were an unbelievable team and, and perennial contenders, even though they seemed to falter in the playoffs. But uh, I got there, I would say, mid-February and played probably 20, 25 or 28 games with them. And we won, we, we won most of them. I think we... Well, probably 22, 23 games of the, the remaining, like 28 games. And so we went into playoffs really hot. First time, that was my first experience in playoffs, actually, coming from Toronto and Calgary. And uh, had a tough, tough first round. We played uh, L.A. It was, very, it was very physical. It was a tough first round. Beat them in six games. Then we actually played Detroit. And we we won the first three games, so the the atmosphere was electric. We're like, man, we're gonna we're gonna walk all our walk right into the Stanley Cup Finals, and we got a little ahead of ourselves. Detroit won the next three games, and we had so game seven was at home in San Jose, and and it turned out that my uh, my ex wife was uh, in labor for game seven, so she came to the rink. So at game seven, the playing in San Jose, the the building was absolutely electric and we ended up winning and it was 3-2 so we won, so now we're going into the conference finals against Vancouver and that same night my uh, my daughter was born too so it was it was quite uh, quite a wild adventure and you know, it's getting, your, your question is to, to getting traded twice in a year, I mean it's it's getting traded, it's difficult you're, you're when I first got traded, I, I was I never really thought about it, but how it works and the logistics and whatnot. But I got traded from Toronto to Calgary, so I got a call on a Sunday, I think around 11, 11 in the morning, and then Calgary uh, Daryl Sutter called me from Calgary, and he said that a plane will be on the tarmac at five o'clock, so you have you know six hours to pack your life up and, and move across the country and just start a life somewhere else. And you kind of basically leave your family behind and let them sort everything out. So it's, I mean, it's, it's probably the more difficult part of our sport, but uh, you know, and it's, it's exciting at the same time for, for new beginnings. All right. Um, so I just have a question. Um, you had two stints in Detroit, one in for the Red Wings and now for the uh, mechanics and all that stuff. Out of those two cents that you played in Detroit, what was your favorite memory or what's your best memory playing in Michigan today? Well, it would have been playing for sure, playing for the Red Wings. Um, so after that season in San Jose, um, got got a contract in, in Detroit here, and, and Detroit has such a history and so many so many Hall of Fame players. And when I came here, I didn't I. I always come kind of with an open mind. I didn't know what to expect. And the first day of training camp, Mike Babcock had me paired up with, with Nick Lidstrom. And so you, you go from being a young guy, you know, kind of or idolizing or looking up to, you know, a guy like Nick Lidstrom to, to all of a sudden I'm, I'm in Grand Rapids. That's where our camp was. And, and, and now I'm his D partner. So it was, it was very surreal, but it was, it was such a thrill. I learned so much from playing with, with him. I think we probably played, you know, 72 or 73 games of the season together. And I learned so much from him. He was such a wonderful guy. And, uh, you know, not to take anything away from, from all the other uh, veteran players that they had, guys who had won four Stanley Cups, you know, whether like even a guy like Thomas Holmstrom, we had uh, Dasu probably the most talented player I've ever played with Zetterberg. Um, you know, it was just, it was a very, a very fun year. That's awesome. So you played in a lot of places. Uh, what, what are your favorite barns you played in as far as like maybe NHL and then even to the, the fed level? 
Yeah, for when I when I started out with Toronto, um, when we would go, we play Montreal basically uh, Saturday nights, and uh, the Bell Center in Montreal it seats I think twenty, just over twenty one thousand people, and uh, the Maple Leaf uh, Montreal rivalry is just probably second to none in the league. And the fat, the the energy in that building is just electric, and it's really unmatched, pretty much anywhere. Uh, that was it was always such a thrill. I mean, you're 21, 22 years old, and and you're you're skating out to all these people just going nuts. It was such a thrill. Um, what what would come close to it, quite frankly, though, is in San Jose at the Shark Tank uh, when we went into playoffs there. And it's it's a quite a bit of small arena. I think it's probably maybe sixteen or seventeen thousand people. But the the way it's designed, I guess, with the metal roof, it doesn't have any sound dampeners, and the noise in there. It's just, I mean, you you can feel it in your in your chest everywhere. It's just deafening, and it's it's so much fun to play. Um, can you tell us about what it was like being signed for the first time and how all of that went down? Okay, sure, yeah. Uh, so I had just played as an 18 year old, I had played the world junior tournament. I was drafted by Toronto coming, I was playing a swift current and the Western hockey league at the time. So I played world juniors as an 18 year old and I had a pretty good tournament. There was four other Maple Leaf draft picks at that tournament on our team actually, who were also, uh, 19 or they're 19 years old, a year older. So they had to sign. A contract that year so right after the tournament uh, I'm pretty sure in January and maybe one or two guys in February signed contracts with Toronto and I wasn't uh, it wasn't my, my signing year so after the season in Swift Current I went home to Manitoba I was working at a golf course doing golf course maintenance and so I was riding my tractor, cutting grass, and, and my, my agent calls me. So I answer the phone. I'm sitting on my mower, and he says, hey, i got two things to talk about. He says, one, he's like, how is your uh, off-season training going? And it was May, I think. And I said, I said it's good. Like, I'm not <laughs> – I wasn't really training, but I said, it's going good. And then he says, number two, he's like, Toronto wants to sign you. I said, why are we talking about training, man? <laughs> so he – and I didn't really know what signing, I mean, I knew what signing a contract was, but I didn't know any of the details or, or how, you know, how it works or any of that stuff. So he explained it to me. He said, it's an automatic three-year deal. Uh, they're offering you, I was a six-round draft pick. And he said, they're offering you if, if uh, five, 500000 for the first year, five fifty, and six hundred for the third year. And then he says, and they're going to give you a, a $500,000 signing bonus. And so I had the phone and, and I said, I said, so does that mean if I say yes, I get half a million dollars? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> and so I said, all right, I'm so Yeah. I say, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> so I signed a deal within a couple of days and um, yeah, it was, it was quite a surreal experience. Right after that, I went to my, the, the head greenskeeper. I said, you know, cause we were getting up pretty early to cut the grass. Say, hey, I'm not working anymore, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> nice you were uh your first year in detroit you were putting up almost all-star level numbers on the line like you said with nick lynch lidstrom and the following year it kind of hate to say it went off the rails but can you are you willing to tell us you know, what pretty much ended your nhl career can you are you willing to talk about that? oh absolutely yeah so so my so I, I signed a two year deal there, and then I played my first year with with Lidstrom, and then the next year there was no NHL for because of the lockout. We, the players we got locked out. Um, I had moved to Detroit. I, I had young kids who one of them was in school, so I moved there at the start of, when the season would have been starting, even though it wasn't starting, just to get them in school. And there was probably ten of us who would skate and practice and just kind of wait for, for whenever the season started, which turns out, I, I believe it didn't start till February, early February, actually that year. Um, and so I was practicing with the team or with, we're 
not sanctioned, but there's probably a ton of us skating. And it was, I believe it was December, and I came off the ice, and there was always local reporters hanging out and, and you know, wanted a few sound bites. And one of the reporters said, hey, do you, you, did you hear that Gary Bettman wants to take a two-week break in negotiations with the players? And so we've already been locked out, I guess it was three months or so. And I just said, I said, really? I said, oh, man. I said, I think Gary Bettman's an idiot. And I said <laughs> one more sentence. Then I went to my, I showered up, went to my truck. I sit in my truck for a couple of minutes. And I said, you know, I think that's going to be a big story. So I walked back into the rink and I asked the, the reporters, the local reporters, I knew them. I said, hey, do you guys mind not, not printing that? I don't want to cause any... You know, any friction between the, the players, the union, and, and the owners? And the one reporter's like, well, you said it. I said, no, I'm not denying I said it. I said, I just don't want, you know, any to create any any problems. Anyway, she she goes on to mention that she had, she said she already tweeted it out. I didn't even really know what tweet, uh, Twitter was at the time, but I, I didn't really care because I did say it, and at the time, I, I was being truthful. So... Walked away, I went home, about a 20 minute drive home. I opened my computer and I just type in Ian White, Gary Batman. And there's about 15 headlines, different articles. The headline was Ian White calls Batman an idiot. And so that got me in pretty hot water. Uh, I don't want to say he blackballed me, but he might have. <laughs> and so anyways, we started in February. I was in good shape, had a good start to the season. So there's a contract year now. I think, I don't know how many games we actually ended up playing, but maybe 30, 30 games or maybe 40 at the most for the entire season. So that's the window I had to, to earn another contract. So I come out of the gate pretty hot, had a, had a good first game. Uh, the second game, I played really well. I had a very nice goal in, in Columbus. And the third game, I was back checking. Uh, a guy, it was basically like a guy had a mini breakaway, and I was chasing him down. And we got about to the hash marks, and I dove to try to poke check the guy. And ended up, we both went crashing into the goalie. And I took Jimmy Howard's goalie skate, the front or the back. I'm not sure which one, but goalie skates have like a sharp pick on the front and back. I took it full speed right on the top of my knee and it cut my leg like wide open. And so anyways, I, I take the hit. I realize right away it's pretty bad. I didn't look at it right away. I just, I skated off the ice. As soon as I sit down on the bench, I, I pull my sock off. And I mean, it was, it's like a dull knife. Someone's stabbing you with a dull knife, right? My, my leg was just wide apart. So I ended up having to, to go to the hospital and, and have surgery on it. And, uh, I was out for probably probably four weeks, and by that time, it, by that time, Mike Babcock, we we didn't really see eye to eye. He had, he had actually scratched me the season before, even though I was having a, a great season the season before, but we didn't see eye to eye, and so he he scratched me again. Pretty much the rest of once I got health healthy from that injury, he, I don't know if I don't even know if I played a game after that. So. After that season with Detroit, a little bit of follow-up, can you tell us how, is there a reason why you didn't get another shot with another NHL team? All right, well, actually, I did. I went to, so that summer, I didn't get any contracts or contract offers that summer. And then three days before training camps were to open, the following year, uh, I, so I spent my summers in Kenora, uh, Kenora, Ontario, and three days before training camps opened up, I got a phone call from Kevin Sheveldayoff of the Jets. And he asked me, he said, do you want to come to camp? And I didn't really, I, I was laughing inside. I, I didn't actually laugh on the phone because I hadn't been on the ice since for probably five or six months. I hadn't worked out at all. I was, was in, in pretty poor shape. And but I couldn't turn down a tryout offer, right? Especially kind of my hometown team. And so I said, yeah. So that day I found some ice. I went skating 
the next day I got ice again. I went skating, try to quickly get in shape. And then the third day, the last day I had to, to work out, everything was so sore and stiff. I said, I'm taking this day off. So then the next day, training camp's open. I show up. We have a fitness test. Um, for whatever reason, I, I actually do stay in shape pretty easily. And so I, I got through the fitness test. I did pretty well. And then the, the on-ice session started the day after, and I, I was actually pretty good. I played the first preseason game. I played the most out of, out of anyone. And, and just like, I'm like, oh, you know what? I might, uh, I might end up doing this. And I ended up sticking around for eight days, and, and they ended up letting me go. I don't know if, uh, you know, by that time, I'm pretty sure, well, I, I'm for sure in the league, I had kind of a reputation of a party animal. So I don't know if, if that's why they let me go, but uh, that was that was my last chance. All right. So you played hockey both in the United States and Canada, seeing that you were born in Toronto. Um, my question to you is, uh, which style of play do you like better? Do you like the United States uh, style of play, or do you like the Canadian style of play better? Um, you know, I, I'm not I'm not so sure at the professional level. There's much of a difference. I mean. I, I grew up in, in in the Canadian, you know, the minor hockey leagues there, and I never obviously played minor hockey uh, in the American uh, system, so I can't compare those. And then once you get to the professional level, the the systems are, are pretty much the same. I mean, there's teams in Canada uh, Canada that have American coaches. There's teams in, in the states that have Canadian coaches. It's, it's all pretty much. Uh, pretty similar I would say so that that's actually a tough tough question to answer I I do I mean I, I'm somewhat old school I guess I'm not saying this is the Canadian style versus American style but I like the the rough and tumble physical type hockey um, I would say I guess the the better uh, comparison would be like North American to European that's where I see a big difference but uh, um, I, I like gritty Pretty kind of old style hockey. So, what are what's your future plans with your your hockey career, and how much longer do you think you'll be skating before you hang the skates up? I, I really have no plans. Actually, I, I go day to day. As long as I'm enjoying playing hockey, I'm going to continue to play. Uh, I I had hopes, you know, probably probably well ever since I I wasn't able to get back into the NHL I, I obviously hope to, to do that and one thing after the other kind of a hurdle got put in my way and then about three years ago I wanted to, to put a solid effort into to getting back to playing professional and then COVID happened and the rinks were all shut down and, and all that mess and so I had all but written hockey off uh, I was coaching for the past seven, five, six, seven years, coaching little kids and, and getting such, just getting great joy out of that, loving, loving being around little kids and teaching them hockey. And it was last December, I was doing, I was into the trades working because they shut all the rinks down. I couldn't coach anymore. And I got a phone call from, from Justin Schmidt to, to go down and play hockey again. And so... I said, absolutely, I'd love to do that. Uh, it was a bit of difficulty getting down to the States because I actually, I think still to this day, you're not allowed to fly into the U.S., uh, whatever the regulations are with, with the COVID stuff. And so I went to the Winnipeg airport, tried to, to get, on, get a flight, couldn't do that, went to the train station, tried to take a train. You're not allowed uh, in, the, in Canada, you're not allowed in the train stations, due to some medical status. Um, and it ended up, I actually had to walk across the, the U.S. border with my, my skates over my shoulder and a suitcase rolling it down the highway. I walked across the border in a rural part of Manitoba, got into North Dakota, hitchhiked down to Fargo, and caught a, caught a flight from Fargo to Minneapolis and down Atlanta to get to play with uh, play in this league. Uh, with with Columbus last year, and, and as soon as I got down there, it was just such a great feeling, just being around, being in a locker room again, playing hockey again, being around the guys. Um, it's just it, it, it ignites something in you again, 
and I had such a great year last year playing. If, and and in this league, I know I'm pretty sure. I, obviously, I can't play forever, but I could play for probably as long as I want. So I'm having fun. I'll keep doing it as long as I want to. That's such an incredible experience to to do what you did to be able to play the game that you love. And um, Columbus fan here, and I know that um, we were really sad to see you go, but. I wanted to tell you one thing I really loved about watching you play. You have the smoothest passing that I've ever seen in the league. And um, we have actually have a question from Damian Frazier. His question was, what was it like living with Schmidt? Ah, yes. Um, it was, it was very, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was very interesting. We, we ended up becoming best friends. We still are to this day. Okay. And so I, I got down there, I believe it was December 21st last year. So the rest of the team were, were on holidays. And so it was, it was literally just me and him. And I had no idea what to expect. I, I didn't know where I was living or how. I just was happy to get down there. So he picked me up in Atlanta and drove me to, to the house where we were going to stay. And, and we, we just became best friends basically instantly. I walked into the house. The house was... I, I have to say it every time I, I talk, but the house was pretty messy and I'm not a very clean individual myself, but anyways, there's a bunch of young kids in there and, and then just, or they weren't at the time, but had been living in there. I walked in there and, and it was just, it was very surreal. But so we hung out, it was just me and him, I guess, for the first, probably till after Christmas. So we just, it's just, we just hung out every day. We didn't have a vehicle. We just walk around. We we're kind of living out in the in the boondocks in in Alabama, and it was it was very fun. We had a great time. I lived so I lived with him there till um, I I think we flew. I flew with him back to Calgary middle of June. So yeah, we lived together for six months. It was it was an amazing time. I, I had absolutely a blast last year. We just went down to visit him. Brought my wife down there. We actually stayed in my in my old bedroom. He gave he so he took my bedroom this year, and was nice enough to to give it back for about five days when we came down there the last uh, a week and a half ago. But it it was it was great. Yeah, living with Schmitty, it was it was never a dull moment. Uh, it's pretty pretty widely publicized. You towards the end of your NHL career, you had some legal issues. Are you willing to discuss those and tell us about some of your legal problems and how you got through all that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So uh, another, another, you know, very convoluted story. But uh, it, it, so put simply, I was driving home from uh, Costco in Winnipeg. I am. Uh, I was at the time a firearm owner. I had. Uh, I bought. 13 guns uh, in Canada. You need a special license to buy guns. I had a, a gun license, a gun permit. All my guns are bought legally. So I went to Costco and Walmart or sorry, Costco in Winnipeg to get gas. And I was driving an Escalade. And so I had jerry cans of gas in the back. I had the back window up because it smelt in there. And I was driving down a two lane road, a guy, our lane, I was in the right lane. Our lane was, there was construction, so we had to merge into the, the left lane. And so there's two cars in front of me. And so the first one merges, then one car on the left lane goes, another one merges, and then it's my turn. So I, I double shoulder check, and I put my blinker on, and I start merging in. This guy behind me floors it to not let me merge into the lane. And so I had a big truck and I said, I don't, you know, I don't care. So I pulled in anyways. This guy starts honking his horn and being, being a, being a prick. And so I give him the old, you know, let's pull over. So as soon as the lane opened back up, I pulled over, he pulled up. And before I could put my truck in park, he's out charging my vehicle. So I saw through the mirror, he was a middle-aged guy, kind of heavy set. And I knew I could, you know, I could handle him, no problem, but I'm not that kind of guy. I'm not, you know, but I'll get in your face. So he comes, he comes up to the window, yelling and screaming. And, and I said, calm as day. I said, listen, buddy, I just want you to know that whatever happens from this moment on, 
this is all because you're being a prick and you wouldn't let me merge into the lane. That's what this is all about right now. Anyways, I get out of my car. We go back and forth. Probably go five minutes. I never lay a hand on him. We get back to his car. He had a, a, a woman in his car. And I realized this is going nowhere. So the last thing I said to him, I said, you're lucky your wife's here or I'd be smashing your face in the pavement right now. And then I turned. I went to my truck. Got my truck. Winnipeg's about an hour from the, the U.S. border. I started driving to the U.S. border to buy chewing tobacco. I got about halfway there, and the Canadian police have the highway blockaded with shotguns out. And I'm looking around. I'm like, there's no way this is for me. I'm like, I haven't done anything. But there's no one else on the road, so I stopped in the middle of the highway. They're on their bullhorns yelling at me, shut the car off, get out. Ended up arresting me, throwing me in jail. And what happened was that guy on the side of the road called the police that I threatened his life. And I got charged. I didn't know that was a charge, but I got charged for uttering threats. So as a firearm owner, they, at least in Canada anyways, I had to meet with the, the chief firearms officer of the RCMP just to make sure I'm not going around threatening people's lives and whatnot, right? Otherwise, I'll take your guns away. So I met with her. At the time, I had two houses. I had that cottage in Kenora where I spent most of my time. I had it for about seven or eight years. And I, ha I just bought a house in Winnipeg. And in Canada, you have to have all your guns registered at one address. And so I told her, I said, all my guns are in Kenora. Is that fine? She said, yep. Fast forward to November. I'm That was May, sorry. Fast forward to November. Late November, I think it was the 30th, I'm in. I'm at my house in Winnipeg, and I get a phone call from the Winnipeg police. They said, uh, hey, we're, we're coming to check for uh, a hit and run from last night with a white Escalade with Ontario license plates. And so I, I told them, I said, I was home last night. I wasn't doing anything. And so they said, well, we're a couple of minutes away. We're going to check for paint transfers. I said, sure. So a couple minutes later, they call me and say, hey, come outside. We're here. As soon as I go outside, they arrest me and said they had a search warrant for my house. So tear my house apart. I'm, the whole time I'm sitting in the back of the squad car so about th for about three hours. And after they do the search, they come out. And, and the, the old adage, you know, you're not supposed to talk to police. I'm just kind of a friendly, open guy. And I was talking to the, the police officer that I was sitting in the back of the car for like three hours. We're talking about hockey and whatnot. Anyways, the guy who was doing the search comes out after they completed the search and he says, where are all your guns? And keep in mind, I just met with like their chief officer and told them all my guns were in, in Kenora. So I assumed they all, they knew where your guns were anyway. But I told them, I said, they're all my, my cottage in Kenora. Because I said that, that gave them probable cause to go to my cottage and search my cottage. Now, our gun laws in Canada are, I, I consider them extreme, but they have to all be stored a certain way. And I lived out in the bush, like I hunt and I fish, like I was out on a lake and, and kind of in the middle of nowhere. And so I had a, a 22 in the garage, I had a 12 gauge at the door, I shoot birds and eat them. And so not all my guns were stored the way our regulations are in Canada. So they did the search and I had bought three guns off our team security guard in Detroit here and brought them across the border. And I ordered an air rifle BB gun online and I brought that across the border. This air rifle BB gun shot. It was a pretty, pretty, pretty nice gun actually, but it was just like a, like a crack barrel BB gun. It shot faster than 495 feet per second and in Canadian law that's considered a firearm and because I brought it across the border they charged me with importing guns so I ended up getting out of that search of my cottage in Kenora I got 19 charges and I was looking at doing uh, 27 years in jail just because my guns weren't stored properly and because I brought them across the border so that that essentially ruined my life. Yeah. Now you had you had I uh, went through some substance issues. I believe you had said at one point from your injury. 
And the, the time you spent locked up, you had mentioned, I believe, that that helped you kind of sober up and get over your, your stuff. Position. I think it's a great story. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it was from, from an injury. I mean, I was always, from a young age, uh, I, was, I was drinking and, and smoking weed and doing drugs, I would say, from you know, 15, 16 years old. Uh, you know, in junior, we were, we were hanging out and drinking a lot. And then I went to play in St. John's uh, in the AHL my first pro year. And, and that was my first taste of pro hockey. And, and all I would say all the guys on the team, all we do is not all we do, but we'd hang out and, and have fun. And everyone was drinking from coaches to, I mean, obviously lots of people drink, right? So I, I was drinking every day from a very young age or a young age. And I had career success. So I went from St. John's to Toronto. I mean, after, after games, you go into the family room, you're having drinks. After the game in the locker room, you're having drinks. And that, uh, that just continued. And, but I was able to perform. And, and I mean, it was just kind of the, the hockey culture, I guess you'd say. Um, and so I, I, I was an alcoholic from from early on, I didn't realize it because you just continue it. You're drinking every day, so you never notice. And then, well, even yeah, so even in Toronto, uh, you get you know you're obviously hurt a lot of the time. You, I get uh, doctors would give you Percocets, painkillers, stuff like that, and you take them you know occasionally, and uh, that continued basically throughout throughout my career. And then in Detroit, what you're referring to is is that so that injury where I got the goalie skate across my knee. I went to the hospital and uh, the hospital here in Detroit, they gave me fentanyl. And so if you're uh, the way I see it anyway, if you're, if you're uh, prone to addiction, you know, any type of substance can, can, you can get hooked on it. So uh, got that, got that shot of fentanyl and, and it was just essentially like pure euphoria. Um, and so I ended up becoming hooked on fentanyl for at least two years. It might have been three years until I ended up um, getting getting arrested there. I think it was November 30th. So up until that point, throughout my uh, years of drinking and, and using drugs, I had always had access to, to some sort of substance, whether you know alcohol or marijuana or any sort of drug. And when I got into the fentanyl, I always had fentanyl and never, never went without it. And so once I was in, in jail, that was the first time that I didn't have any substances. And I went through a, a very hard uh, withdrawal and I didn't even know what was going on. Right. You're in denial for, for the most part. And I'd, I had never in my life gone without. This was the first time I'd, I'd gone without and I'm sitting in, in my jail cell and you just have this, this very intense, very, very just, it's just a full body painful. You're sick and you're depressed and, and yet your mind, all you can think about is, is getting more, more drugs or alcohol. And so it was like a light switch went off. It's like, man, you, you have a problem. And so, that was that was the wake up call. It's like you know you need to get help. To, you need to get off these drugs. So I was in jail, I think, for three days at that at that particular time, and I ended up uh, reaching out to the the NHL PA, and they they hooked me up with uh, a treatment center on Vancouver Island, and I was there for for seven weeks, and and I got sober there. Well, I'm glad that you got the help that you needed because you know it's it's always pray for people to actually reach out for help. I wish more people would do that because, you know, help is just a phone call away. Um, but we'll go back to talking about your hockey a little bit and all that stuff. How would you say that hockey has changed since you started back in 1999 uh, with the Steelers and the MJHL? How would you say that hockey has changed from back then until now as far as uh, like the style of play and officiating and everything else? Like yeah, that? I would say it's it's gotten faster. I mean, most that's what happens with you know, most, uh, you know, whether it's technology or sports in general, uh, things get faster. 
So the, the the play of the game right now is a lot faster, and they've they've adapted and changed some of the rules to to help that too. Like when I first started playing in the NHL, it was mostly uh, older guys, bigger guys, as more clutching and grabbing, um, which obviously slowed slowed the pace of play down a little bit. And they started putting putting in these rules or calling you know more hooking and holding, and getting rid of the clutching and grabbing, which actually opened it up for or more players like myself who are, you know, maybe a little bit smaller, but more skilled guys. And you didn't have these, these, these big ogres out there who just had a big wingspan who could, you know, hold and hook and, and uh, clutch and grab. So I think it's, it's gotten, I wouldn't say that it's gotten more skilled, but in a sense it has, uh, there's, there's, there's just more playmaking and, and I would say higher skilled and, and quite a bit faster. Than when I started. If you don't mind telling us, how did you end up in Motor City from Columbus? Certainly. So in summer, I got married to a girl. Uh, she lives in Cambridge, Ontario, which is about two and a half, well, about three hours from from here. And I had been after the season in, in Columbus, towards the start of this season, I've been talking to a bunch of the teams in this league. Uh, just trying to see what offers were out there. And I looked on the website and I saw that, that Detroit had this new team. So I said, oh, you know what, I'll, I'll reach out to them. So I, I sent an email on their, just from their website, I sent an email, like the contact us uh, link. And that went to, to Nick Fields, I guess, our general manager here. He called me pretty much right away. And we, we worked out a deal that was, was close to, you know, I was excited to play back in Detroit here. And this is close to, to my new wife as well. So, yeah, we got uh, we got a deal done. Um, could you tell us what would be your favorite moment when you played NHL, but also what is your favorite moment um, so far playing in the Fed? Hmm. Uh, well, I'll, I'll go with the Fed first. Um Getting, getting a chance to go into playoffs last year. We, we had such a great group of guys in Columbus last year. We were very tight and got into the playoffs. You know, it's the first uh, meaningful games that, that I had played in, you know, probably nine years. And so the playoffs last year in the Fed were, were, were very exciting. That would be likely my most meaningful moment in this league. As, as for the NHL, it would be – I'll, I'll put a, I'll pick a couple, couple moments. The, you know, the first game you play is is quite a special moment. I was uh, playing for the Marlies, Toronto's farm team at the time, and I had a, I had a really good, I had a really good first year that, which was in St. John's. There, that was a lockout year. There's no NHL that year. I had a good year there, and I was hoping to actually have a chance to make the Leafs the next season at the start of camp. And went to camp and ended up getting sent down right away. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's all right. And uh, <laughs> and so I got sent down and I figured, well, you know what? I'll probably be one of the first call-up uh, players for D. And went. so I had a good season in, with their farm team in, in Toronto. And didn't get uh, all the other D were getting called up before me. And it was, it was pretty frustrating. And then towards the end of the year, after there was a whole bunch of injuries, and I remember watching the, uh, one of the Leafs games, and they were on the road, and a D-man got hurt. And we had they had already called up all the other D-men, and the rest of our D were hurt. So I was sitting there thinking, I'm like, you know what? I'm like, they have to call me up. There's literally, like, no one else. So sure enough, I got the call. And they were playing in Jersey the next night. So they called me and said, we're, you know, we're flying to Jersey. So I had to go down downtown, grab my gear, and get on a plane. And, and I think I flew into JFK. And then, you, you know, you go under the Hudson and, and get to, to Jersey and suit up. And, and at that time, the, the lease were made up of some of the legends of the game, like Matt and Dean was your captain. So I walk into the the arena in, in New Jersey and you go in the locker room and you're, you're actually dressing up with, with all these, these players and you're playing your first game. It was such a memorable, such a memorable experience. Um, and to compare that, I would say uh, I, I touched on it 
prior, but when I was playing for San Jose, the first time I got into playoffs, it was just, it's an app, it's an unmatched atmosphere. Um, the, the energy, the electricity around the room, around the team, around the city, around the league, just the, the energy of playoffs is, is unmatched as well. And, and we went on quite a successful, you know, obviously we ultimately didn't get to our goal, but just getting to play three rounds of playoffs and have a chance to, to go to the, the conference finals, it was just, it was very memorable. I think Anna just gave us the perfect segue to a fan question. Uh, Janae and Levi want to know if you miss Berkeley as much as Berkeley misses you. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a funny story too. That so when I moved to uh, to this house in in down in Alabama last year, I was the oldest guy in the league, obviously the oldest guy in the house, and and so I was kind of the dad of everyone. And it was a very rural where we lived was very rural, and we drive whenever we drive home, probably once a week. There was this van that this this kind of hillbilly redneck lady would sell some dogs from a puppy mill and i mean i love dogs i i used to have a dog and so guys are always well hey you know let's go look at this dog and i said you got we're, we're not getting a dog we got to going to get a dog for the house so we're not getting a dog i mean we're gone half the time and so who's gonna look after this you guys can barely look after yourselves and uh Anyways, but I say, hey, it's ultimately it's your decision. So it was uh, Levi and Mike Cosentino. They said they'd split this dog, uh, a baby German Shepherd. I mean, I love dogs. I said, I'm not taking it home. I'm not taking care of it. I'll play with it and stuff. But so anyway, they brought the dog home. Uh, and it wasn't, I, I, it might have lasted a month. Not, it didn't die. <laughs> but. They had, uh, we had it for a month and, and Mike Cosentino, I guess he gave up kind of splitting ownership with the dog. He didn't realize what kind of effort went into taking care of a pet. He thought it would be a lot simpler. So Levi took it over and, uh, eventually I, I believe his mom had to drive down to pick the dog up, to take it back to, to Illinois. I believe that's the story because it was just not being looked after. Or I don't know what the decision ended up being, but that is a funny question. Well, Ian, it has been so amazing having you on. I know we could probably do a whole nother episode with you. Uh, we, you know, There's just so many questions, but your story is really remarkable, incredible. And thank you so much for taking the time to, to come hang out with us and, and tell everybody about your life. Absolutely. My pleasure. Well, we, yeah, we wish you the best of luck Thank in Motor you. City and uh, definitely miss you down in Columbus, but, uh, you know, still a big fan here. So. All right, guys. God bless. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Have buddy. a good night. You will be safe. Uh, just a special thanks again to Ian White for joining us. It was such a great episode. We had an amazing time um, hanging out with you. Your story is incredible, and I hope it inspires people in um, different ways. But I, I can tell you, your story definitely inspired me. Me too. Yeah, it's definitely a true success story. You know, I've got, you know, family members, my grandfather, my, my baby sister, both suffered with substance abuse, and they both they both beat it, and um, it's such an amazing and a wonderful story to see somebody like him who not only beat it and was able to resurrect his career. It's great. To hear his story, it kind of reminds me of the definition of resilient. He bounced back. Whether he didn't make it back in the league or not, he beat the, he beat the addiction. And guys, all it takes is to reach out and ask for help. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it just takes that one – it takes that one critical moment in your life to look over at the phone, pick it up, and know that there's somebody on the other side for you. It's never, ever too late to pick up the phone. There's always a good start to start somewhere and rather than wait until it's too late. So pick up that phone, um, call it. There are people that are there for you, but I love this episode. It was great to hear his story about the NHL days, his uh, my youth days and growing up, and his other personal stuff. It was a great episode, guys. I think we went pretty well on that tonight. Yeah. Now, this past weekend, we had a, a, a wild, bit of a wild weekend. The the rivalry renewed between Carolina <laughs> and Columbus. 
and it extended beyond the ice. Unfortunately, there was a little bit of a controversy. Carolina fan trying to interfere with the Columbus broadcast. Guys, come on, have a little bit more class. You know, I don't. I hate. I, you know, I don't want to get get into it too much about about her, but come on, keep it on the ice. You know, it's okay to talk crap, but stuff like that is not necessary. Come on. That's true. And. Also, uh, that goes for any team. I hope when people come to our barn that we don't treat other teams that way. And um, like like Lee said, have class in both ways. If you go visit a barn, be respectful and have fun. You know, chirp, clap back and all of that good stuff. But there's definitely a line where, you know, don't be a dick, basically. Cause the- and that also falls onto our Facebook page that we, we do have. Phew, that was a dumpster <laughs> fire. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just... Don't don't cross boundaries that you wouldn't want crossed. Right. Treat people like human beings. I understand it's a game. I love compassionate fans, but let's not be assholes to people. And the point yeah, is, yeah, I couldn't say it any better. People are doing this because because you love the sport, you love the sleep. Anyway, at, at the bottom line is you're getting the broadcast for free. You're not like you're paying for it. You give some respect to the people that are bringing you stuff for free. You can't beat that at all. Hockey TV is twenty nine ninety nine a month. FPHL YouTube is free. You can have common courtesy just a step over five inches or five feet, so the video guys can do their job. You know, it's it's a service that they're doing for us fans. You don't have to be an asshole. Exactly. I'm you know me and Anna. We're fifteen hundred miles away. You know to get to watch. FPHL hockey this far away and not have to pay for it. I am so grateful for all 10 teams that provide it. Even yes. the ones that might not be the best quality, like maybe Delaware. It's still free. Yep. The end of the day, you're not having to pay 30 bucks a month or 150 something or $200 a year for the whole season. It's free. Shut the frick up and enjoy it. Watch it. And don't mess with them. Leave them alone and let them bring it to us for free. Let don't you're going to ruin a good thing. Absolutely. Um, you know, like Lee was saying, we're like and follow that as well while we're while we're there. Yeah. Spread the word. Yep. Yep. So, and also one last point I wanted to make. You know, you can feel good about yourself because you clap back harder or whatever, but keep in mind, like the fans also reflect the team. So you could really give your team a bad rap by being an asshole to other people that, and you know, if I drive 300 miles, a thousand miles to see a game, the last thing I want to deal with, I'm all about having some fun with the fans, but you know, there, there's a point where just sit down and shut the fuck up. (laughs) I'm just going to say it. Exactly, exactly. Well, this is the time of the show where we where we uh, thank our friends of the show and our sponsors. You know, let's not forget Pro Hockey News, ProHockeyNews.com. Go to the description. There's the email address for Lou Lafredo if you're interested in covering one of the FPHL teams. Reach out to him. He'll get you set up. You know, their podcast, again, is a, it's a fun listen, you know, every week, every every Friday along with us. Listen to us and then listen to them. We also have uh, Pred TV. They're out there catching predators that are after our children. So definitely go follow them. And the Chattahoochee Valley Warriors, they're a great organization, um, getting veterans in skates and helping them learn how to play hockey. And um, if you're interested in being a sponsor, please reach out to us. We have an email address that will be linked below. And um, you can always reach out to us on our Facebook page. And Ed, tell us about your amazing coffee. I own a coffee company, a coffee roastery. So if you want fresh, freshly harvested, uh, fresh to cup coffee, uh, come check us out at the Enchanted Coffee Co-op on Facebook. That's the only place you find us at. And pack your bags for a coffee adventure. So yeah, the link will be at the bottom and all that stuff. But and just sign up and experience coffee from all over. But as soon as you listen, just listening to us right now. So make sure that you like and subscribe our. Um, Broadcast if you're listening on YouTube and on Spotify too, because every little, every like, every subscribe helps us along the way as well. You know, if everybody could just share us with one 
friend, family member. Um, we're, we're really trying to, to reach you guys. So um, if you're enjoying that, us, please let us know because I know we are enjoying making content for you guys. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Now, uh, we, would, we, we would be remiss this week if we didn't mention uh, Tobias Ojik, who plays for the Danbury Hattricks. Uh, his father, NHL legend Gino Ojik, passed away this week. Uh, everybody here, that 10-minute misconduct gives our condolences to Tobias. Uh, me, as you can see, I got my Islanders jersey back there. I was a huge Islanders fan. Gino was one of our, you know, legendary enforcers. You know, he's, he's a legend. And to lose him at such a young age, he's only in his 50s. It's, it hurts the hockey community's morning, the Islander community, the Canucks, Canadians, Flyers, the whole NHL is mourning his loss, and we give our condolences to Tobias, to the entire Ojik family, and stay tuned here. After we sign off, we have a little special tribute and slideshow for Gino. When you go to bed tonight, say a prayer for him. If you still have your parents, reach out to your mom and dad, because life's too short. So Tobias, the Ojik family, we give you our thoughts and our prayers. Rest in peace, Gino. You'll be missed. Absolutely. I'm sorry to end on a sad note, but we just couldn't end a show without being able to mention him. So um, please tune in next week. We got Ryan Marker, and we're, we're pretty excited for the things to come up in the future. So we will see you guys soon. Thanks for joining us.